The artistic grasslands are as important a heritage factor for us in New Zealand as our tall forests and our high mountains. Few people know the tussock grasslands of New Zealand better than Professor Alan Mark. He has spent almost 50 years of his life amongst them. My original interest in tussock was as part of my master's study on Mangatua, where tussock grassland was a part of the area. It was a controversial issue then in terms of its management. They were degrading seriously, there were serious erosion problems. I knew enough about it to know there were a lot of unknown factors, a lot of questions to be answered and it seemed to me important to try to get answers for those questions to manage the system more sustainably. Alan became the first fellow of the Hallaby Grasslands Trust, which was set up to monitor and research indigenous grasslands. He devoted much of the next 50 years to studying upland snow tussocks. This New Zealand snow tussock is common throughout the mountains of New Zealand. It's a very slow growing plant. We have no means of dating it, but knowing now something about its rate of growth and the size of the plants, it's probably a century old, probably several centuries old. It consists of three to four, five hundred individual but connected stems with four or five leaves on each stem. The individual stems in this two here are referred to as tillers and this is all leaf from here on up. The amount of stem on the plant is extremely small, just a few centimetres, and where is it? Right down at ground level. The tip of the stem is where the plant is growing from, where the new leaves are produced. So the fact that the stem tip is right down at ground level protects it from the extremes of the environment, and in particular protects it from the heat of a fire. According to Alan, these tussocks have been burnt throughout their history. Before humans arrived, natural fires started by lightning strikes would have periodically consumed the grasslands. Early Polynesian settlers burnt the forest and shrublands, allowing the tussocks to colonise a far greater area. In the wake of European arrival, the grasslands were repeatedly burnt. Burning the tussocks caused fresh green shoots to come through, and these were grazed by stock. To see how the tussocks would do without these pressures, Alan fenced off eight sheep-proof plots, which have remained intact for over 50 years. We know the history of this area very well for the last 65 years. The run holder, when I set it up in 1959, said it hadn't been burned for 20 years. It had been grazed up to that time. So it's probably the longest record we have in the country. When Alan began his study in the 1950s, it was believed the snow tussock grasslands were a transitional state of plant cover unsuited to current climatic conditions and doomed to extinction. Burning and grazing were merely hastening this process. Alan wasn't convinced. He thought these tussocks were far better adapted to their environment than most people gave them credit for. Alan wanted to find out whether the smaller snow tussocks at high altitude were genetically different from the larger ones further down slope. He realised he could use flowering patterns to find out. When there's a flowering year, most plants are flowering. And when there's a non-flowering year, virtually no plants are flowering. So that synchronous flowering is a real feature of our snow tussocks, better demonstrated in these snow tussocks than any other genus in the world. Alan observed that temperature differences were the trigger for flowering. By relocating tussocks up or down the mountain, he would see how they reacted to conditions at different altitudes. I took 20 plants from each of these plots, cut the plants into five sections, cloned them in other words, planted one section back to its own site, took the other th sections to the other three sites, and one to Dunedin at sea level. In a flowering year, the pieces shifted back to their own site flowered with the local population. Plants shifted to lower altitudes flowered every year. But interestingly, intriguingly, the ones I moved up in altitude to a colder site never flowered. The upper plots of Allen's study were high on Central Otago's Old Man Range, a remote and exposed place where only the hardiest plants survived. Yeah, well, this is the, my top plot on the Old Man Range, almost 1,600 metres, almost on the top of the mountain. And so I was interested to know how the lower altitude tussocks would do up here at high altitude. Ellen's lower altitude plants survived, but they didn't flower. 
This showed Allen that robust as they were, these plants were adapted to their local conditions, further down the slope where he'd taken them from. My conclusion was that these plants were highly attuned to their local environment, in fact, attuned to the local environment and different in the different locations. In other words, tussocks at varying altitudes were genetically different from one another. They were not misplaced hangers-on from an ancient time, but plants that were ideally adapted to their own environment. Allen believes the upper slopes of the Old Man Range were once covered in tussock, However, at these altitudes, the tussocks were unable to recover after burning and heavy grazing in the early days of high country farming. The new leaves coming after fire are nutritious. Most of the nutrients from the plants are going into those leaves, and if those are grazed severely, the plants can be severely damaged, even killed, within a single season. Similar damage is also evident at lower altitudes where farming has been aggressive. You'll hear we have a fire break that was built by the run holder in 1961 and uh, this area was burnt in 1961 but recovered from that stage. It was burnt again in 1992 and the, the heavy stocking has virtually eliminated the snow tussock. And what's replaced it? Unpalatable festuca. And it's uh, providing now as much cover as the sparse remaining tussock. But over here, the other side of the break, we have the uh, snow tussock unburnt since 1940 and uh, virtually no fescue in here. Allen's studies have shown there are very good economic reasons to protect snow tussocks and in particular their amazing ability to collect water. Yeah, well, we're here on a fairly foggy day on the Old Man Range and you can see how the tussock has stripped the water, intercepted the water from the passing fog. It's just laden in moisture those drops are running down the leaf, down the channels of the leaf, into the base of the plant. And you see how the leaf is channeled here, it's like a, a U-shape, and the water runs down the furrows of the leaf, right into the very base, right down into to the, where the stems are at ground level. Very little material there to trap the water, most of it goes straight into the ground and uh, increases the soil moisture, and that, most of that water becomes available then for water yield. They have a leaf anatomy where the rolled leaves have the stomata on the underside of the leaves in furrows. And when the air dries, the leaves roll and close the furrows and virtually conserve water within the plant. So these plants lose very little water. Studies have shown a single tussock can collect up to half a litre of water every hour from fog alone. Up to 80% of water is released into the ground. Tussocks are the world champions of water yield. So it's economically valuable, as well as keeping the soils moist and feeding the streams coming off these mountain slopes. Tussock grasslands of New Zealand are recognised around the world as something special, unique to New Zealand. They are part of our New Zealand heritage, as important as our traditional heritage of high mountains and tall forests, and I think are being recognised as such today as uh, we're getting increasing areas of these tussock grasslands into our conservation system than we ever had in the past.